Morning, folks. What an honour it is to be here as we launch our SNP manifesto, the most left-wing manifesto for the 2024 general election. I'm Hannah Bardell, and before I bring our First Minister on stage, I just want to make a few comments and observations. For the SNP, this election is about hope. It's about what we can do to protect and enhance the lives of the people of Scotland, because there's been precious little hope coming out of the UK establishment in recent years. And I remember when the 56 of us rocked up in 2015, someone from the establishment said a few weeks in, oh look, the Scots have arrived. Very telling that they had Scottish MPs sitting there for decades, not speaking up for Scotland and certainly not representing Scotland's interests. So whether it's Conservatives or Labour in number 10, we all know that Westminster is broken. But until we are an independent country, our communities need hope and they need us representing them and protecting them from the continuity of austerity and the conspiracy of silence on cuts that a Labour government will bring. And it's sad really that Labour's main pitch to folk is vote for us because we're not the other guys and we might be maybe slightly less bad than them. People need a real alternative. And as we know, Labour have been parachuting candidates into constituencies across Scotland, including mine in Livingston, where my, my uh, Labour candidate lives in Tottenham. Not sure where that is in Livingston. But the truth is, folks, Labour have put the Conservatives' clothes on and they are marching towards Downing Street. The only thing between Scotland and more cuts, more misery and more of the same is the SNP. We are the only line of defence against a dull and un uninspiring and harmful Westminster consensus. And our SNP MPs have brought flair and diversity, new and unique voices and perspectives to Westminster. And we've also had a kickabout in the chamber. We brought progressive politics and policies right to the heart of Westminster, to the establishment at the same time as delivering for people in Scotland. Just imagine what we could do with all of the powers of independence. And at Westminster, the SNP has stood up for post office workers, for the WASPy women, for the victims of contaminated blood and the Primado scandals, and families the length and breadth of our constituencies who will face not just a poverty of finance, but a poverty of ideas under a new Labour administration. Friends, the people of Scotland and our constituents deserve and can have so much better. So now, to unveil our 2024 manifesto, please be upstanding and give a warm SNP welcome to a politician who's been demanding better for Scotland for many years and is ready to take us and Scotland forward to independence. Friends, please welcome SNP leader and First Minister of Scotland, John Swinney. Good morning, friends, and welcome to the launch of the SNP manifesto for the 2024 Westminster election. This election takes place at a time when people are hurting. The aftermath of COVID has left scars amongst our people. The cost of living crisis has meant people are worried about their future and the well-being of their loved ones. We're living in a period of rapid change where new technology, the climate emergency and the implications of an ageing population will all have a profound impact on the way we live our lives in the future. Given this atmosphere of turmoil, more than ever, I believe political leaders and political parties need a set of values as a foundation from which to respond to those challenges. I believe people are crying out for principled leadership, which is prepared to argue for what it believes in. So today, as I launch the SNP manifesto for the 2024 general election, let me set out the core values of the Scottish National Party that anchor our proposition to the people of Scotland. We are a moderate left of centre party in the mainstream of Scottish public opinion, firmly rooted in the ideas of inclusion and internationalism. We will always put the interests of people in Scotland first, wherever our people were born, wherever our people have come from. And at the very heart of our beliefs is the principle that de decisions about Scotland should be made by the people who live in Scotland. Why? For the simple reason that no one else cares as much about this wonderful country 
and no one else will do a better job of taking care of it now and in the future than the people who live here. It is through independence, therefore, that we believe we can build a fairer country and a more prosperous economy we know is possible. Not independence for its own sake, independence for the powers to protect our National Health Service and to help people through tough times. Independence for a stronger economy and happier, healthier lives. And independence for a better future for Scotland, made in Scotland for Scotland. It is those values that govern our overall approach and the content of this manifesto. So let me outline the choice the SNP offers to the people of Scotland at this election. First and foremost, we are the only party, the only party arguing for an end to the spending cuts. The arbitrary Tory fiscal rules adopted by Labour bake in more eye-watering cuts, £18 billion of cuts. The SNP manifesto argues for new, sensible fiscal rules that will end the cuts, reverse the £1.3 billion cut to Scotland's capital budget and invest in public services starting with the health service. We, we will join with progressive politicians south of the border to press for greater funding for the NHS and for the UK Government to match the pay deals that we've given our health staff in Scotland. That would see an extra £1.6 billion for the National Health Service in Scotland. And we would introduce a Keep the NHS in Public Hands Bill at Westminster, a legal guarantee for a publicly owned, publicly operated health service. The SNP message on the health service is clear. It is simple and it will never change. The NHS is not for sale. Voting SNP. <laughs> Voting SNP is a vote to protect our public services and our precious National Health Service. Friends, I've made clear the focus of my government will be to eradicate child poverty. The two-child benefit cap makes things much, much worse. It is the exact opposite of what the UK government should be doing. Introduced by an uncaring Conservative government, it is frankly beyond me that the prospective Labour government plan to keep this deeply damaging policy. SNP MPs will press for the two-child benefit cap to be scrapped. The future of the two-child cap is a simple test. Are you in government to help children out of poverty or are you so morally lost that you push kids into poverty? Our choice to abolish the cap is obvious and it is driven by our values and we will assert that in the House of Commons after this election. <laughs> Those values that demand the removal of the two-child cap also drive the SNP on so many issues, not least nuclear weapons. We will demand an end to the obscene waste of billions of pounds on a new generation of weapons of mass destruction. And while we're talking about waste, SNP MPs will demand that the House of Lords is abolished. Our values, Scotland's choices, elected government, not ermine-clad cronies. Lift the two-child cap, not the cap on bankers' bonuses. Bairns, not bombs, and investment, not cuts. I believe those choices represent the values that most of us share. They are Scotland's values, and a vote for the SNP, a vote for this manifesto, is a vote for those values for Scotland. Friends, every election is a choice. Over recent years, the outrageous Westminster power grab has been designed to reduce the choices Scotland can make for itself. That must stop. The devolution-busting Internal Market Act must be revoked. Westminster routinely passing laws in devolved areas 
without the consent of the Scottish Parliament, must end. For Scotland's workers, we will support the end of exploitative zero-hours contracts, the unacceptable practice of fire and rehire, and we will fight to scrap the so-called Minimum Services Level Act, which is an attack on the right to strike. Fighting austerity against Westminster austerity cuts, for the N for our National Health Service, for better working conditions and against the Westminster power grab, working whenever we can with others to promote practical, moderate, left of centre policies. That is what the SNP are offering the people of Scotland at this election. We will stand up for Scotland at Westminster and we will put the interests of Scotland first in the Westminster Parliament. But we know that the Westminster system is broken, no matter how much we try to mitigate its impact. I think most people in Scotland know that too. So our ambition is to transfer power from Westminster and into the hands of the people of Scotland. Taking decisions in Scotland for Scotland works. Using the limited powers of the Scottish Parliament has had a real impact on people's lives. The SNP has introduced a more progressive tax system to help fund the NHS and other public services. We've delivered the best performing core A&E services in the UK for nearly 10 years. We're helping with the cost of living through free prescriptions, all day off-peak rail travel and free bus travel for young people. We've overseen a massive expansion in renewable energy and are already halfway towards net zero. We've delivered many more affordable houses per head of population than England or Wales. I know, however, that we must constantly strive to strengthen our work in transforming the lives of people in Scotland. Through measures such as the Scottish Child Payment, we're keeping an estimated 100,000 children out of poverty. That is the SNP in government at Holyrood, working day in, day out, to earn and re-earn the trust of people in Scotland. Now, we will not, not always get everything right, but we will always, always put the interests of people in Scotland first. The UK is going in a different direction. It's going in the wrong direction. Far too often, the interests of Scotland are ignored altogether. I've spoken a lot in this campaign about the ABC of Westminster imposed austerity cuts, Brexit and the cost of living crisis. Scotland wanted none of that, but they were all imposed anyway against our will. So today, I want to introduce a D to that list, democracy. With independence, people in Scotland will always get the governments they vote for. That's how democracy should work. Engaging in respectful persuasion, taking account of everyone's view, working together wherever possible in the national interest. And it's through the power of democracy that we will win our independence. There is no other way to do it. We must never lose faith in the power of the democratic voice of the people of Scotland. In 2021, they voted for a Scottish Parliament with a clear majority for independence and for a referendum on the question of independence. That democratic choice must be respected. At this election, we have the opportunity to reinforce the case for Scotland becoming an independent country. It is the substance of the case that will take us there. And that starts with the economy. Scotland has resources and talent in abundance. We have extraordinary energy resources, a world-class food and drink sector, an incredible tourism offering, brilliant universities, thriving financial services and creative industries. And we are at the forefront of the industries of the future, such as offshore wind power. Since coming to office, the SNP has grown both productivity and the Scottish economy faster per head than the United Kingdom. But most economic powers still lie with Westminster, and the UK economy is failing far too many people. In an independent Scotland, we could be back in the EU for the first time as an equal member in our own right. We will be part of the huge single market, which by population is seven times the size of the UK. We would enjoy once again the benefits of European free freedom of movement, vital 
for so many Scottish businesses. Our young people would have the opportunity again to study and to work freely across Europe. And in turn, we would welcome our fellow Europeans to Scotland. The SNP has funded one of Europe's finest programmes dedicated to the creation of high growth businesses with a potential market of 450 million people in the single market think of the massive opportunity for further growth. Of course, an independent Scotland, like all countries, would face challenges. Success would not be guaranteed. That would be determined by our own decisions as a country and the choices we make. But when we look at independent European countries similar to Scotland, there are grounds for optimism and hope. Countries like Denmark, Ireland and Sweden are wealthier per head than the United Kingdom. They are fairer with lower inequality. They have higher productivity, the key driver of living standards, and they have lower poverty. So with all of our resources, all of our talent, with everything we have to offer and all of our ambition, why not Scotland? In an independent Scotland, people would have a constitutional right to access a system of health care free at the point of need. The threat of creeping Westminster privatisation would be over for good. Staffing in our health and care services would not be subject to a hostile Westminster migration policy. And our public services would not be subject to disastrous Westminster austerity policies. So never let anyone tell you that independence is separate from people's daily lives and concerns. It is fundamental to their lives and their concerns. It is about where decisions about Scotland are made. Decisions over our economy, our health service, our living standards. So on July the 4th, I'm asking you to vote SNP. I'm asking you to vote SNP to put the interests of people in Scotland first. I'm asking you to vote SNP for a future made in Scotland for Scotland. Thank you very much. Okay, right. Thank you all very much. We'll now move on to some questions and I'll invite questions from a range of uh, broadcasters and journalists that are here. So we'll go first of all to James Cook from the BBC. James. Thanks very much, First Minister. Your manifesto here says that if you win a majority of Scottish seats, then the Scottish Government will be empowered to begin immediate negotiations with the UK Government to give democratic effect to Scotland becoming an independent country. Just, I wonder if we can be totally clear, are you suggesting that not even with a majority of votes, but with just a majority of seats, that Scotland could become independent without a referendum? And also, will you accept that if you don't secure a majority of seats in this election, then Scotland will have voted to maintain the union? Well, what our position is, James, is, and it's set out in a manifesto, is that if the SNP wins a majority of seats in this election in Scotland, uh, the Scottish Government will embark on negotiations with the UK Government to turn the democratic wishes of the people of Scotland into a reality. And the democratic wishes of the people of Scotland were expressed at the 2021 Scottish Parliament election, where just a few miles from where we are today, there is a parliamentary majority in favour of independence and in favour of a referendum on the question of independence. Now, I have long made clear my view, and it's my party's view, 
that we, the best way to secure independence is through a democratic referendum. The obstacle to that is the intransigence of the United Kingdom government. So what this election gives people the chance to do is to intensify the pressure to secure Scottish independence and to bring that about by voting SNP in order for us to achieve a majority of Westminster seats at this election. And so if anybody out there is keen for Scotland to be an independent country, then the only vote they should cast is for the Scottish National Party, because that's the only way it's going to happen. And, 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 and lastly, James, um, forgive me for um, uh, not predicting the outcome of the election today. I'll leave that to the good voters who will be exercising their postal vote in the next few days and those who attend the polling stations on the 4th of July. Right, uh, Ewan Petrie. There you are, Ewan. Thank you, First Minister. You've said throughout this campaign that Labour and the Conservatives' plans would lead to billions of pounds worth of cuts. Can you be absolutely clear how you propose that these parties find this additional money for the extra investment in the NHS you've talked about today? Does it involve tax rises? I, I've said, to, it's not just me that said there's going to be, there's a conspiracy of silence about the spending cuts. And it's not me that's putting forward that analysis. It's been put forward by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, the Institute for Government, the Nuffield Foundation at the weekend, uh, the, the, the Nuffield Trust, I should say, um, one of the most respected health commentating organisations in the United Kingdom, if not the most respected organisation, said that any increases in health service expenditure uh, from the Labour Party or the Conservatives would be lower than the worst years of austerity under the Cameron government. Now, that is, that is one heck of a proposition from the Labour Party. So it's not just me that's saying that's austerity coming down the track. That's what the Labour Party have signed up to by their acceptance of the fiscal rules of the Conservative government and the starting point that they accept. And I think that's a terrible conclusion for the Labour Party to arrive at. I've also said that you know, we've taken some hard decisions in the Scottish Government. We've increased tax on higher earners so we could invest more in our public services. We've now, we've, you know, we've done that so that we've got £1.5 billion available to us that can invest in our public services, a lot, a lot of which goes to the National Health Service. So if the UK Government was to replicate what we've done on tax decisions, there'd be more resources available to invest in the National Health Service, as I've set out. And that would be just one measure a UK Government could take to end austerity and invest in our public services. But I also think there's some further dangers that are coming our way, which were confirmed yesterday by the Scottish Labour leader, because Anna Sawar set out yesterday his determination to reverse the decisions we've taken on tax. Well, people need to have their eyes wide open. The Labour Party yesterday in Scotland, along the road at Murrayfield Stadium, committed themselves to cut public spending in Scotland directly as a consequence of voting Labour, that's a double whammy. Yeah. So people need to be really aware of what is the consequences of voting Labour. Voting Labour in Scotland will get you spending cuts, yeah. and that will be a disastrous outcome from the election. Uh, Peter Smith. Yeah, Peter Smith from ITV News. Um, First Minister, it couldn't be clearer, page one, line one, as you promised. Vote Scotland, vote SNP for Scotland to become an independent country. These are your terms. You are the party putting independence on the ballot paper in this election. You're telling people how they can vote for independence. Surely you can't have it both ways. You have to be honest with people. How can they express their view that they do not want Scotland to be an independent country in a way that you will listen to it and respect it? And can you tell me what would be the consequences of the SNP not getting a majority of seats in this election for the independence case? Well, I, I, I think the, the, the wishes of the people of Scotland are pretty clear on this question. They elected a parliament in 2021 that has got a majority of members who are committed to independence and the holding of a referendum. And I think that should be respected. And we should get on with that and just respect the wishes of people in that uh, 2021 election. And again, forgive me for not predicting the outcome of the election today. I, I'm going out and I've been working very hard around the country to make sure that we get our message across and that we win this election, and that will be the focus of all our efforts. Um, Tamara Cohen. Tamara. Thank you, First Minister. 
You've said that independence can't be separated from people's day-to-day -day concerns, but many of your supporters don't seem to agree. While support for independence is about where it was 10 years ago, support for your party is projected to fall. And I wonder if you can tell us why you think that supporters of independence will be turning away from the SNP at this election. Why have you not brought them with you? I think there's, there's two things behind that, Tamara. One is that the SNP's had a tough time for the last wee while. And I'm here to address that, and we are strengthening our position, and we're working hard to command the trust and the confidence of people in Scotland. The second thing is that people are desperate to get rid of the Tories, absolutely desperate to get rid of this awful, awful Conservative government. And they are considering, and I put it no further than that, considering voting Labour. But I find it my duty to say to people, be careful what you wish for because the Labour Party is going to pick up where the Tories left off with spending cuts, and that will be a disastrous outcome for Scotland as a consequence of this election, with our SNP MPs in office to protect the people of Scotland from Labour cuts that will follow hard on the heels of Tory cuts. Um, David Wallace Lockhart. David. Thank you, First Minister. David Wallace Lockhart, BBC Scotland. Um, this manifesto reads quite a lot like the manifesto before, which read quite a lot like the manifesto before that. You talk about delivering independence in the near term, you talk about reversing Brexit. Are you not asking Scots to send SNP MPs to Westminster who you know ultimately won't be able to deliver any of these policies? If you look at Brexit, David, um, everybody knows that Brexit has been a catastrophe, a total disaster, and it is undermining our economy, it's undermining access to people to contribute to our economy, it's, it's undermining the tax take of the United Kingdom because of suppressed levels of economic growth. That's got to be said out loud. It's got to be confronted. It's got to be addressed. We can't just resign ourselves to the fact that the United Kingdom has taken a decision that is deeply damaging. And we've got to act to reverse that, which is why that commitment is so central to the policy proposition that we are putting forward in this election. And that will be, and that sentiment and that objective will drive the commitments and the priorities of SNP MPs elected to the House of Commons. Um, Catherine Sampson, Catherine. Catherine Sampson, Channel 4 News. I just wanted to pick up on that, Mr Spinney. You know, at previous elections, you've said, vote SNP to deliver independence. It has not been delivered. You've said, vote SNP to stop Brexit. It was not stopped. And then looking at your domestic record, you haven't delivered on climate change targets, among other things. I just wonder, what's your message to Scots with Labour looking like a more realistic prospect for them, who might be wondering, what's the point in voting SNP this time round? I think in terms of you know, what does the Labour Party look like? Um, well, the Labour Party looks like a party that's going to prolong child poverty by keeping the two-child limit. I, that's beyond, I, I can't fathom that. I would have thought, I, th th this election is supposed to be about change. Where's the change? We're going to carry on with the two-child limit. We're going to carry on with the Tory fiscal rules. We're going to carry on with Brexit. Where's the change? We all know that the two-child limit is keeping children in poverty. We know that Brexit is damaging the economy. We know the fiscal rules are, 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 are undermining public services because of austerity. And, that, that, and, and the Labour Party says that represents change. That represents the continuation of Conservative government, and that's a disaster for Scotland. And I would encourage people in Scotland to look carefully at that issue. Um, I'll now move on to Hannah Brown of ITV. Hannah. Thank you, First Minister. Can I just check, you will accept that if you don't get the majority of seats, you can't progress with indie negotiations until the next election? I'm, well, I'm, I'm not going to predict the outcome of the election, Hannah, but what I'm going to say is that there's a basic democratic point. The Scottish Parliament was elected in 2021 with a majority of members within it committed to having a referendum on independence and wanting that independent country to be established. And I think that democratic mandate should be respected. And I think if we get to a point in the United Kingdom where we just have a, what I might call a casual attitude to respecting the democratic outcomes of elections, I think we're in really, really dangerous territory. So I would, so I, what I want to see happen is the respecting of the mandate that's been given by the people of Scotland 
to enable Scotland to become an independent country, and that should be at the heart of the outcome of this election. Um, Neil Poorin. Here's Neil. Minister, Neil Puran from Press Association. Uh, Labour suspended one of its candidates today because of past posts they'd made uh, about Russia. It's also been reported today that your candidate in Orkney and Shetland um, previously made posts which uh, he suggested he had doubts over whether the Assad regime carried out chemical attacks in Syria. Do you think this was appropriate and uh, do you think the party should be taking any action on this? Well, I certainly think that it's a, it's proven beyond any doubt that um, the Assad regime undertook chemical attacks in Syria, and I completely deplore uh, those actions. And uh, I'd have to look at uh, any individual comments to determine whether there's any um, stance required to be taken. But let it be crystal clear that we condemn the actions of the Assad regime and their actions in relation to, well, not just chemical warfare, but in a variety of other uh, actions of the Assad regime. Uh, Kieran Andrews. Thanks very much, First Minister. You've talked a lot about deficits in your speech and answers today, both fiscal and, as you say, democratic. But I'm just thinking back to previous election launches at much bigger venues than this that were actually full and thinking when the SNP were in uh, stronger positions in the polls. And I wondered if the biggest problem for the SNP at this election is a deficit of enthusiasm. Well, uh, well... Um, uh, the, the, the last time I looked at this room, it's full, so <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, it, and it's lovely to be here. Um, I, th I think, well, I certainly have found plenty of enthusiasm. I've now visited, um, let me just think to give you an accurate number, Kieran. I've now visited 40 campaigns around the country, and I've encountered large numbers of very enthusiastic party members engaging with members of the public. So uh, I think our party is working very hard on the ground. Uh, I'm delighted with the, the work that's going on. In relation to the polls, look, I, I, I acknowledge that, and I you know, answered it in relation to, I think it was in relation to Tamara's question, we've had a tough time. We've got progress to make in the polls. Uh, I'm determined that we'll make that progress for when it matters on the 4th of July and our enthusiastic campaign around the country will do exactly that. Um, Paul Hutchin. Paul. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Libby Brooks. Oh. Two words. Um, yesterday's Scottish Labour manifesto didn't include the devolution of uh, immigration law or employment law, despite there being multiple calls for that. What makes you think that Keir Starmer is going to listen to you on devolution of tax, for example, after the election? Well, I think, that, to be honest, Libby, I think that's a question that would be better put to the Labour Party. <laughs> because the Labour Party are, have got a big test coming up if they become the election. They've stood with us, for example, on recognising the threat to devolution from the Internal Market Act. What's the Labour Party going to do with that? Are they just going to pick up where the Tories left off? Where they've picked, off and picked up where the Tories have left off on austerity, on um, the question of Brexit? Is that, are they just going to carry on that line of argument? This is a moment for devolution to be respected, for the wishes of the people of Scotland to be respected, and for Scotland to be able to make choices about our own future. And that will only come about if there is a strong vote for the SNP at this election. Um, can I come to Simeon Kerr from the FT? Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, from the manifesto, it seems that we still don't have any clarity regarding exactly what you could do with, in, with North Sea oil and gas li licenses. Um, do you not feel that it might be better to have, uh, rather than just talking vaguely about the climate compatibility assessment, either give the energy industry the clarity it needs about whether those licenses will be granted in the future or uh, appeal to you know, more climate-obsessed voters and rule them out. Thank you. What, I'm, what we're doing in the manifesto is setting out uh, a rational basis for taking decisions about oil and gas licenses, which I would uh, remind everybody are decisions um, for the Westminster Parliament and the Westminster Government. And We've set out in the manifesto the importance of uh, achieving the transition to net zero 
and doing that with the oil and gas sector in a fashion that is managed and orderly to ensure that the oil and gas sector is able to continue to make a contribution towards the transition to renewables that we require and also to make a contribution to our energy security requirements. Now, in every circumstance, those, any application has to be the subject of a climate compatibility assessment. And I think that's the orderly, rational way to do it. The Prime Minister has said that he, will, he would authorise 100 new licences. I think that's utterly irresponsible because th there is no process involved in that. It's just, a, it's just a commitment to continue without interruption the development of oil and gas, which we know is a serious issue in, and is incompatible with the long-term journey towards net zero. <clears throat> so the, the process we're setting out is a rational, orderly process to ensure that we achieve net zero, that we guarantee energy security, and that we support individuals who are employed in the oil and gas sector to be able to transition to the new opportunities that exist in renewables. Um, can I come to Andrew McDonald from Politico? Uh, hi, John. Yeah, Andrew from Politico. Um, looking around in this room here, uh, there are two banners boasting about the achievements of the Scottish Government, but both of them, free prescriptions and free tuition fees, are from over a decade ago at a time when Alex Salmond was in power. Is that not a bit of a sign that your government has ran out of steam? OK, there's one up there called free childcare, right? <laughs> and the free childcare, free childcare was delivered by this government in 2021, and it now offers double, double the level of free childcare that was available when this government came to office. So we are continuing to put in place the investments and the steps that are required to ensure the um, uh, families are supported. You know, a family in Scotland saving five and a half thousand pounds a year because of that banner up there on free childcare. Now, I'm not sure, uh, I'm just going to look at the other um, banners that are up here. We could have had one up here about 100,000 children kept out of poverty because of the Scottish child payment, and that was just introduced in the last couple of years. So I'm going to take no lessons about the urgency and energy of government from anybody when our government is delivering measures that are lifting children out of poverty and we are doing all that we can to protect families at a time of such difficulty that they face at the present moment. Now, um, <laughs> Alistair Grant from The Scotsman. There's Alistair. Uh, hi there, thanks very much. Just to be crystal clear and to go back to the issue of independence in this election, is your position seriously that no matter how people vote in this election, even if the SNP loses a vast number of its seats, that that is still a mandate for independence because of how people voted in the Scottish Parliament election in 2021. Is that seriously what you're saying? Well, I, I, I think people in Scotland should have their democratic wishes respected. And in 2021, they called for there to be a referendum uh, on the question of independence as a consequence of electing a parliamentary majority committed to that particular objective. And in this election, if people want to intensify the pressure for that to be the case, then their opportunity is to vote for the Scottish National Party to make that happen. And I stress, it'll only happen if votes for the Scottish National Party are cast, because it's only votes for the Scottish National Party that will be able and capable of delivering independence. Um, Alistair Clark from The Courier. First Minister, your candidate in Orkney and Shetland cast doubt over Russia's role in the Salisbury attacks. In West Aberdeenshire and Kirkcarden, you have a candidate who described a, pe a speech by Putin as illuminating. You've stood by those candidates. Is this an SNP return to bending the knee to Putin on Russia today? No. <laughs> Under no circumstances. I think the Putin regime is evil and it has to be confronted at every opportunity. Um, Hamish Morrison from The National. Thanks, First Minister. Hamish Morrison from The National. Um, I just wanted to um, ask you about the preparations for uh, negotiations for independence. It doesn't seem to be anything in the manifesto of saying what you're actually doing to prepare for them. And also, can you give any reassurance to Brian Cox, who thinks that you're backing off the idea of independence? OK, well, um, a future made in Scotland. I think that's a pretty clear commitment to independence. The, right on the front cover of our manifesto. And then if we open up the manifesto, 
vote SNP for Scotland to become an independent country. I think that's quite clear. Uh, I hope it's clear enough, anyway. Um, and then, in relation to the preparations, uh, as you'll be familiar with, uh, Hamish, there's been good work done within the Scottish Government on a series of documents to prepare the arguments and the mechanisms around independence, and that's exactly what uh, the Scottish Government would take forward in the aftermath of this election, to prepare for uh, independence and to ensure that we're succe successful in, the, in, in delivering the outcome of this election. Um, Jessica North. Hi, First Minister. I um, just want to touch on your answer on oil and gas a little bit. Uh, can you set out today what specific measures or tests or thresholds a company that is seeking to start drilling in the North Sea will have to meet to get your government's approval and pass your climate compatibility test? Well, it's important that we look at, uh, and th these uh, analyses are, 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 are undertaken on a frequent basis, of looking at what are the climate implications of an individual policy decision. And we assess them um, on a constant basis within government about the implications of particular policy interventions. So there are methodologies that will enable that to be undertaken that look at uh, the, 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 the implications of all aspects of the preparations for and the delivery of that policy commitment. So that's the type of framework that we would put in place to enable that to be achieved so that everybody knows where they stand. Oil, oil and gas development companies know where they stand, the government knows where they stand, and, that, and the analysis that is undertaken on um, climate measures um, uh, is clear in every respect. So what we, we have to do is to make sure that we have an, a, a rational process that enables people to explore those questions and to assess those policy options uh, to the satisfaction of the climate compatibility assessment that we've set out in the manifesto. Um, Conor Matchett. Uh, thanks, First Minister. Conor Matchett for the Scottish Sun. Um, this is a, I mean, generous here, a 30-page document, um, which is thin on detail, full of rehashed policies, many of which um, the SNP has failed to deliver on in 17 years of government. This is a sign of a party that's frankly just given up, isn't it? Uh, no, it's not, Connor. Um, and, you know, if I come back to some of the points that I, you know, I set out a second ago, um, the Scottish child payment, that's, you know, are we really, really dismissing the fact that 100,000 children have been kept out of poverty? Is that where we've reached in this debate? Is that the summit of where we've got to? Or the fact that we are seeing measures being taken to uh, deliver the transition towards renewable energy that has essentially decarbonised electricity within Scotland and we're halfway towards our journey towards net zero. Are we seriously dismissing these elements of, of progress? So what this manifesto does, Connor, is it sets out an agenda that will enable Scotland to seize the opportunities of independence for us to be a country that can use the strengths and the foundations of Scotland to the greatest and the maximum effect for Scotland. And that's the opportunity that's available to people to vote for in Scotland today. Um, I see that Paul Hutchins is here, so I'm going to ask Paul Hutchins to ask his question now. Thank you, First Minister. Um, what, since 2015, a barrel load of SNP candidates have been elected to Westminster. But apart from claim a decent salary, expenses and squabble, among themselves, what have they actually delivered for the people of Scotland? Because I can't think of a single thing. If we, well, let, let's, well, let, let's take one particular example. Um, one of my colleagues is here in the audience today, Marion Fellows. Um, Marion has been in the vanguard of the efforts in relation to um, the Horizon Post Office scandal for years, for years before it was a significant political issue within the United Kingdom. Marion was uh, working hard to, to, get that, uh, to get that issue addressed, that absolute injustice addressed. There's just one example. Stephen Flynn's here in the front row. Stephen has led the pressure on the United Kingdom government about Gaza and the atrocities that are happening there as a consequence of the war in Gaza, uh, raising that issue and pursuing that. Stuart Hosey is here in front of me who um, took part in uh, significant processes that challenged the, um, 
the United Kingdom about the presence of Russian money in the United Kingdom economy and system. So there's just three examples of what SNP MPs have been up to, as well as arguing Alison Thoulos is there, uh, pressing the UK government on the two-child limit. Now, just because we don't get to a, a, a completed outcome on that issue, and it's just beyond me that the Labour Party is not prepared to take the step that's necessary in the two-child limit, shouldn't mean that we take the pressure off, that we just say, oh, well, that's all right, let's just resign ourselves to more kids being in poverty. That's not the politics I'm interested in. I'm interested in politics that will deliver real change and transformation in people's lives, and we're not seeing enough of that from others in this debate. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> Andrew Lermuth. Uh, thanks, First Minister. Uh, in the foreword to the manifesto, you say that you honestly don't believe Scotland can bear more cuts. Uh, yet SNP-run Glasgow City Council is imposing a drastic cut on the transformational MCR Pathways mentoring programme in the city schools. SNP councillors are planning to pass on a 50% staffing cut to the service, which deals with vulnerable children, many of them living in poverty. Uh, how can you and your party justify that? Well, the difficulty... The, the, there's two elements to the budget available to the Scottish Government. There's the money that comes from Westminster and there's the money that we raise ourselves and control ourselves. So on the money that we raise and control ourselves, we are taking appropriate decisions on, for example, issues like business rates. We've got to be careful about how much we raise from business rates because we've got to maintain a competitive position within the economy. Uh, we've taken some hard decisions on tax. So We've got £1.5 billion available to us to spend in Scotland today that we wouldn't have if we, didn't have, uh, if we hadn't taken those decisions on tax. So we've expanded the resources available to us. The problem is that the other much larger amount of money that's available from the United Kingdom government is being undermined because of austerity. So the presence of austerity comes to us from the United Kingdom government. That's why I think it's got to stop, because that's the biggest contributor to our budget, the uh, funding from the UK government that comes from the block grant, and it is being eroded by austerity. Now, if you look at what we've done with our budget for local government, for example, local government received in excess of a real terms increase in its budget last year. Um, and so we're making the maximum resources available to local government we can do but that's in an atmosphere where our budget is undermined by austerity. So when I say our public services cannot bear any more austerity, I, I, I make that point seriously. Because I see, you know, I, you know, I know the public finance is inside out. I spent 10 years as finance minister. I thought I was dealing then with financial challenges. They are of nothing compared to what we're dealing with now. And there are real human consequences of that. So this cosy consensus between the Labour Party and the Conservatives about sticking to the same fiscal rules and the same um, approach to the budget is going to deeply undermine Scottish public services and the public of Scotland need to hear about it. Uh, Louise Wilson. Louise. Thanks, First Minister. Um, I've listened to your comments today and read what your manifesto says, but just to be absolutely clear, when it says that the Scottish Government will be empowered to begin immediate negotiations, what you're talking about there is a Section 30 order and immediate negotiations for a referendum. And briefly, just secondly, the last decade has been uh, marked by pretty tense relations between the Scottish and UK Government. With a likely new Labour government coming in, would you commit to refreshing and renewing that relationship so you can get on better working grounds? Uh, on, on your first point, Louise, um, I, I, I believe the best way for Scotland to become an independent country, the way that will, be, that will address all of the democratic questions and the important questions, is for there to be a referendum on independence. That's what I think is the, the right way to do it. And that would be the purpose of the negotiations that I would take forward in the aftermath of the election. Now, on your second question um, about relationships, um, I, I would say that relations between the Scottish and the United Kingdom government have deteriorated since Boris Johnson became Prime Minister and Brexit happened. That's the moment. So it's not 10 years, um, uh, uh, Louise, because actually uh, you know, we have always, and I've, you know, I've got extensive experience, um, we've 
collaborated as effectively as we can with various governments of different leaderships, the Brown government, the Cameron and Clyde government, the Cameron government his own, uh, even the Theresa May government for a while, although it began to get a bit tricky about Brexit because we just didn't agree fundamentally on Brexit. Since 2019, the relationship has been characterised by what I would call total and utter disrespect from the United Kingdom government, uh, both at a level of um, legislative activity and policy intervention, and at times personal behaviour. So, having said all of that, I do hope that if there is a change of government, that there is the opportunity to, to, to make some more progress collaboratively. You know, I think people know me well enough to know that I'm interested in getting things done, making things happen. Um, and I think the climate has been appalling with the United Kingdom <coughs> government since 2019, and I hope there is an opportunity to remedy that. Um, and the last question will be Simon Johnson. Hi, First Minister. A couple of independence-related questions. Um, you said in response to Alistair that um, if you get a majority of seats in the election, that this would intensify the mandate that you got in 2021. Um, doesn't the flip side of the, that coin also apply that if you don't get a majority, that it undermines the mandate you claim to have from 2021? And secondly, should given the focus on independence in the manifesto, should people voters out there who, for whom independence and an independence minor, uh, referendum uh, is not a priority, should they vote for a different party? Um, I think, well, people will make their choices in the election, and I'll set out why I think they should vote for the Scottish National Party. And in relation to the, the, the whole question of, you know, what should people do in this election, my view is that if people want Scotland to be able to progress to become an independent country, they should vote for the Scottish National Party because that's the way in which this all happens. And that will enable us to, um, to pursue the legitimate democratic wishes of the people of Scotland. And just let me say, one of the things you said in your question, Simon, was that I claim to have, the, I claim there is a mandate for independence. Um, I don't claim that. That was what the people voted for in 2021, and it should be put into effect. Thank you all very much. And um, we'll see more of you on the campaign trail. Thank you very much. <laughs>